We light this candle as a symbol of the light of Christ, which cannot be held back by distance, which shines in each one of us, no matter who or where we are. Come, rest your spirits. We come, hungering and thirsting for God's word. Worship is a time of peace and hope, where all may be fed and healed. Bring us to the time of healing. Come, place your trust in God, who is always near you. Open our hearts, God, to hear your word and to feel your gracious presence. Let us pray. Holy One, we bow our hearts before you this day. Strengthen us in our innermost being and dwell in our hearts through faith. May we be rooted and grounded in Christ, whose love is beyond all knowledge. Help us to comprehend even the smallest part of the beautiful mystery of your grace. Grant that we may experience the fullness of your presence with us. Amen. Hello everyone and welcome to West Plains Online Worship for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Philip Gardner, I'm the minister of the West Plains Community of Faith. And once again this week, I'm joined by guest musician Christy Lamphere. Much gratitude goes to Peter and Marilyn Fox for managing the technical side of online worship and to Peter for lending his voice. The Wednesday lunchtime get-togethers continue to take place at LaSalle Park, beginning at noon, somewhere near the pavilion. Bring along your lunch and enjoy fine company in pleasant surroundings, weather permitting. We hold closely in prayer those in our West Plains family who are on the front line of dealing with COVID-19. And so I invite you to remember Marco and Emma, Lynn, Diane, Tara, and Vicky's husband, Ron. In addition, I invite you to remember several in our community and beyond it who are in particular need of prayer at this time. And I would name Liz, Marnie, Haley, Joan and Bernie King, and Mohammed, and the family of Imam Kamil Gurji. The gifts given to the mission and ministry of West Plains are gratefully received. And now again, let us pray. Holy Presence, we come before you today with summer activities beginning to crowd our lives. 
and yet our souls also need to be fed. Open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to hear your words of hope and healing for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading is the 14th Psalm. The foolish have spoken in their hearts and said, There is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable things. There is no one who does what is good. God looks down from heaven upon us all to see if any are wise and seek after God. But all have gone astray. All alike are corrupted. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those who do evil? They devour my people like so much bread, and do not pray to God. But see, they will tremble with fear, for God is on the side of the righteous. Do not mock the, the hope of the poor, for God is their refuge. Oh, that deliver, deliverance for God's people would come forth from Zion. When God restores the fortunes of the people, then shall Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. The second scripture reading is 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to fetch her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joah, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the harvest, hardest fighting, and then draw back, back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. For the word of God in scripture among us and within us. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, in October 2017, the hashtag MeToo began to make headlines internationally. 
The intent of the Me Too movement is to prompt women from around the world publicly to share their personal experiences of sexual assault or harassment. The movement was not, however, new in 2017. Me Too was established more than a decade earlier, in 2006, by the American activist Tarana Burke in response to her own experience of sexual violence. Burke saw a need for much better support, funding, and resources for those impacted by such violence. Burke focused especially on helping the young women of color from low-income communities who were disproportionately victimized. Burke's dream was to build a congregation of advocates driven by survivors who would then be at the forefront in creating solutions to interrupt sexual violence within their communities. In 2017, however, the Me Too movement gained momentum after serious sexual assault allegations were made against Hollywood film producer Harvey Weinstein. That year, on October 5th, the New York Times published a story outlining multiple allegations of sexual assault and harassment against Weinstein. Within weeks, the earlier tally had exceeded 50. Actress Alyssa Milano, herself a victim, called on people to share their experience of sexual assault using Tarana Burke's Me Too hashtag. In short order, women from around the globe and from many walks of life did precisely that. Perhaps most prominent in the public eye were the Hollywood celebrities who banded together to fight back against sexual assault and harassment in the entertainment industry. They established a legal defense fund for abuse survivors that is appropriately called Time's Up. The Me Too hashtag went viral in Canada, as it had around the rest of the world. The Canadian press named the public conversation around sexual assault and harassment the story of the year for 2017. It's worth noting, however, that even before the Me Too movement took off in Canada, various news stories had already focused national attention on the serious systemic barriers that stand in the way of addressing sexual assault and harassment. Let me name a couple of those stories. In February 2017, the Globe and Mail's investigation titled Unfounded revealed that the police routinely dismiss one in five claims of sexual assault as baseless. The Globe's report prompted an overhaul of how the police approach such cases. As well, in the years before Me Too, many women had spoken out about sexual harassment and discrimination in Canadian institutions, including the military and the RCMP. The resignation and departure of many in leadership of both organizations during the past few months has amply demonstrated that such abuses of power are indeed an epidemic. We had also watched high-profile cases, including that of Jeanne Gomeshi, as they made their way through the courts with outcomes that clearly failed to advance the cause of justice for victims of sexual abuse. While the Me Too movement has raised awareness about sexual assault and harassment, it has also highlighted the urgent need for education about healthy relationships and the essential matter of consent. In May 2018, the Canadian Women's Foundation conducted a survey asking Canadians about consent. Shockingly, it found that Canadians' understanding about what constitutes consent was actually decreasing. Only 28% of respondents fully understood all the components of consent, compared with 33% in 2015. Half of the women who responded to the survey indicated that they had felt pressured to consent to unwanted sexual activity at some point in their lives, often demanded of them by men in positions of power. Meanwhile, a February 2018 survey by the Angus Reid Institute found that millennial men, aged 18 to 34, 
were the most likely to believe that sexually suggestive actions and behaviors were acceptable at work. When asked about how they felt during conversations about the pervasiveness of sexual assault, the participants in a survey of men's attitudes by the magazine Chatelaine responded that 25% of millennial men felt nothing, 42% felt sad, 32% felt angry, and 12% felt bored. Despite the positive gains of the Me Too movement, there's clearly much work left to do. Today we return to the biblical story of King David, but this return marks a stark divergence from heroic tales of a shepherd boy who defeated a giant. In Christopher Nolan's 2008 Batman sequel, The Dark Knight, fictional district attorney Harvey Dent makes a perceptive comment. He says, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. One of the difficult lessons of adulthood is that most of our heroes, whether they are politicians, actors, athletes, musicians, or activists, will eventually reveal themselves to have, to use a helpful biblical idiom, clay feet. In today's reading from 2 Samuel, David's feet are very much made of clay. The David that we meet is no longer the great warrior king. Yes, he has moved Israel from a ragtag group of nomads to a powerful nation with an effective military. He has had a number of political, military, and economic successes. His power is now absolute, but as George Orwell, quoting Lord Acton, prudently warned, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Added to this mix, we find a man who has entered middle age and who feels his strength and sexual attractiveness ebbing. The mixture proves toxic. We know that David at this point is accustomed to taking what he wants. He seems to believe that no rules apply to him, including God's rules. Here's how today's story begins. The narrator of 2 Samuel informs us that we've now arrived at the spring of the year when kings are accustomed to go out to battle. This particular spring, however, King David has decided not to go. Instead, he sends his general, Joab, out to fight the Ammonites and remains within his palace, nursing his midlife crisis. Perhaps it was his feeling of powerlessness and of not being entirely in control of his life that made David decide to exercise his power over a vulnerable woman. The Bible doesn't tell us. What the scriptural passage does offer, with an almost voyeuristic interest, is a description of the king rising from his couch and going for a walk on the roof of his house. From this high vantage point, he is able to spy on a beautiful woman in her ritual bath. The woman was Bathsheba, the only wife of Uriah the Hittite officer in David's army. David saw her, he really, really liked what he saw, and he summoned her. I would emphasize that this is not some vapid hallmark couple story. Bathsheba was assessed by the male gaze and she was found to be a desirable object. King David did what the powerful so often do, he saw, he desired, and he took. Bathsheba had no choice in the matter. She had no agency. The king lusted after her, he sent for her, and he committed adultery with her. There was no balance of power here. Whether his actions should be considered rape can perhaps be argued ad nauseum, but the fact of the matter is, he took her. When David chose to crash through a moral barrier, he did so through the power of his crown and the blood of the sword. Bathsheba was a means to a satisfying end. But then the biblical narrator tells us that David compounded his sin. When he was faced with the news of the result of his heinous act, Bathsheba's pregnancy, he did not at this point exclaim, how wrong I was to attack this woman, I must confess. 
His fear of public shame had nothing to do with the violation of Bathsheba's honor and well-being. Rather, the mighty king realized that he had stooped to betray a loyal officer who was busy fighting the Ammonites on his behalf while he himself indulged in some afternoon nap time. David recalled Uriah from the field and he tried to trick Uriah into sleeping with Bathsheba in order to cover up the pregnancy. But he had not counted on Uriah's fundamental integrity. Uriah inconveniently says, I can't do that, not while my officers are out in the field. Even God's ark, Uriah points out, remains in a tent. Bathsheba's husband ask, asks his commander-in-chief, how can he possibly be unfaithful by enjoying himself when everything about which he cares the most is still at risk? In that moment, Uriah the Hittite, a foreigner and lesser officer, proved himself to be far more honorable than the mighty heroic King David. David then makes another attempt to cover up his crime. He arranges with Joab to have Uriah placed in the battle in such a way that the enemy's expert marksman will eliminate the problem for him. We might question why it is that Joab didn't flinch in carrying out this terrible order that would result in the death of one of his best soldiers. But then, just as Bathsheba would have risked her life by saying no to a king, Joab would similarly have endangered himself by refusing a direct royal order. Loyal to the king, he acts in a way that allows David to save face. Joab puts not only Uriah, but also other Israelite soldiers right where the enemy defenders were the most fierce and lethal. Joab reasons that if Uriah is not the only Israelite who falls under the archer's fire, no one will suspect that the king had planned Uriah's demise. So David actually succeeds in entangling not only Bathsheba's husband, but an entire company of soldiers in his lethal web of deceit. If you were ever tempted to think about the Bible as some fusty, irrelevant, out-of-date tome with nothing to say to the 21st century, this startling passage from 2 Samuel offers some naked, shameful truth that is sadly as much a part of our world as it was the world inhabited by King David some 3,000 years ago. American theologian William Willimon, writing about this scripture passage, notes, the violence on the battlefields of ancient Palestine or on the streets of our cities pales in, in, into insignificance when compared with the violence that is done to one another in the name of love out of passion, the powerful victimizing the powerless, violence done in bedrooms, kitchens, and bathrooms that we label with the euphemism of domestic violence. In our own country, the second wave of COVID-19 has done nothing to stop a rising tide of reports of domestic violence. In point of fact, the stress of life in lockdown has actually put victims at increased risk. For example, Canada's Assaulted Women's Helpline fielded 20,334 calls between October 1st and December 31st, 2020, compared to 12,352 over the same period the previous year. According to Katrina Scott, the director of the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children at Western University, COVID and the associated social isolation is kind of a perfect storm for domestic violence. According to Scott, the higher burden of responsibilities at home, stress of the pandemic, a breakdown of the response systems in terms of courts and police, as well as reduced informal support has made the problem much worse for many women. Most experts agree that government funding has not adequately met the increased need wrought by the pandemic. Victim services have reported that a shift to working remotely has impacted many clients' ability to access resources. Despite these difficulties, women's support groups and shelters across the country 
continue to stress the need for women to seek help during this time. They reassure victims that their crisis lines are open and that help is available. Nevertheless, Katrina Scott underscores the fundamental necessity of bringing men into the conversation. She notes that federal and provincial governments should invest in opportunities and an initiative that would work with men who cause harm to try to intervene early and attempt to reduce their use of violence. Well, it's my hope that this ancient story of King David's sin has been a catalyst to truth-telling for us and for many Christian churches around the world that make use of the ecumenical lectionary. But I need to leave you with some good news to take away from this terrifying text. We know from these First Testament stories that God gave to David all that he needed. In today's reading, however, it is evident that David began to take more and more, and he did so at the expense of others, even to the point of taking their lives. If we follow the story farther, we will learn that God strategizes to hold up a mirror to David's heinous sin, eliciting from David both a gut-wrenching acknowledgement and a firm declaration of repentance. And God does forgive David, but that does not mean that there will be no serious consequences. The rest of the book of 2 Samuel is a working out in history of those serious consequences. For instance, Dave, David's fondest ambition was to be the temple builder. As a result of his sin, that desire is denied him. If we were to declare a hero in the story, however, I would suggest that it is Uriah who, despite being a minor character in the larger story arc about King David, is fundamentally honorable and at great personal cost. Uriah acts with the kind of absolute integrity that su the supposedly heroic king ought to have modeled. In Hebrew, Uriah's name means, the Lord is my light. Uriah consistently demonstrates the living out of his name by walking in God's light in a way that becomes a light to others. And last, but by no means least, there is Bathsheba. Her story will conclude in the first chapters of the biblical book of Kings. Although the child conceived in today's story dies, one of those awful consequences, Bathsheba gives birth to another child by David named Solomon. In due course, Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan will work together to place Solomon on the throne of Israel. In Bathsheba's last appearance in the scriptures, Solomon installs her on a throne at his right hand side, gets up off his throne and bows down before her. This may well be the initiating act of the tradition of Gevirah, in which the office of queen mother becomes a significant authoritative office in the tradition of Judean monarchy. Bathsheba not only survives, she summons up the inner resources to thrive, she bequeaths to other women her strength and her agency. And finally, we have the good news that the promise of God is the same for us as it was for these faith ancestors. From David, we learn that although we cannot escape the consequences of what we do, at the end of the day, God is both just and forgiving. And as we stumble through whatever may be the painful consequences of our wrongs, God always weaves grace and mercy into our lives because God loves us so. Amen.
Pastoral prayer today comes to us from the Lutheran Church in Australia. It was written for their white ribbon campaign to end violence against women. And so let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Hear us, Holy Presence, when we cry out to you for all the women and girls who are victims of violence. Hear us, compassionate Christ, for they are stripped and beaten as you were stripped and beaten. They are humiliated and used as you were betrayed and shamed. For the beaten girls and battered women blamed and bruised by angry men, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the young girls given or sold in marriage and for unwilling brides with no way out, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women raped as a weapon of war, for the children they bear in grief and shame, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the girls denied access to education, told they are stupid or worthless or expendable, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the girls and women sold or tricked into the sex trade and for sex workers exposed to disease and violence, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the mothers whose children are taken away by armies, governments, churches, or family members, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the girl children who are unwanted and rejected, the first to be aborted or abandoned, the last to be fed, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women battered in their own homes and for their children who see and hear the violence, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women trapped in destructive relationships, manipulated, controlled, justifying their abusers, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women who hide their bruises and lie about their injuries for fear of the next attack, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women bullied in their workplaces, belittled, underpaid, threatened with losing their jobs, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women in prison, abused and abusing, beset by poverty, mental illness and addictions, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the women attacked because of their sexual identity, targets for physical or spiritual assault, we cry out to you. Bring justice. For the older women, frail in body or mind, fearful of violence, manipulation, or neglect, we cry out to you. Bring justice. We cry to you, holy God, for our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, ourselves. Bring justice, bring healing, bring hope. And now in that hope, I hope that our world might be transformed to conform with your reign of shalom. We pray together the prayer that your beloved taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
May you know the richness and fullness of God's grace. May you experience every dimension of the love of Christ. May the Spirit dwell within you through faith. And to the Holy One whose power works within us to accomplish more than we could ask or imagine or comprehend, be glory forever and ever. <laughs>